Welcome to Inside, produced in partnership with WDSC WRPT in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Laurie Berner, Executive Director of the ARC Northland. Laurie has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. Like, thank you, Laurie, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. So the ARC is a renowned organization providing mm -hmm. services to those living with disabilities and their families. Talk about how the ARC executes its mission here in this region. Well, we've been doing it for just about 70 years. And so we're a very, I believe, progressive organization where we really keep in touch with the people that we support because things change and evolve over the years. And so when you serve people from birth to death, you know, you have a lot of different variables in that. And so we try to keep in touch and keep things that are very person-centered, very person-focused uh, as far as an individual and what their needs are and what they're looking for from an organization like ours. And so it has evolved over the years. And so um, we also do the same thing with family members, for instance, and keep in good touch too with other service providers so that we know what they're, you know, what they're learning about what people's needs are and how we could possibly work together and reach out to other people as well. And the arc of 70 years is very important because if mm -hmm. you take a look at how Americans viewed people with disabilities, there have been quite a transformation. If you take a look back down in the 1930s and 40s, mm -hmm. very often somebody with disability, a family member who might be held dear, was was very often hidden from public sight. Right. And 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 th this idea of integrating into society people with different conditions, different abilities, disabilities, that was not the way people thought of of, of disability in those days. Exactly. That happened to my, my own family. I have a brother who's 71, and because he had two disabilities, an intellectual disability and blindness, um, he, the only way he could get services was to go to an institution. And my parents, it was horrible, you know, that that's what they felt they had to do to try to help him. And so over the course of time, it has evolved, especially parents back in those days who said, enough is enough, we don't want our children to go away, we want them to stay home. And so then the ARC, literally across the, the United States, is really a reflection of that. Parents really started the ARC, and it's evolved then to be a more professional, but also keeping parents, you know, basically connected with us so that we're always keeping in touch. But that was a huge part of the movement, the beginning of the movement. And there's been many wonderful laws that have taken place since it's almost 30 years now with the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have the Olmstead decision, all these different laws that really help give the human rights aspect to people with disabilities that needs to be in place. One of the major transformations is the idea of advocacy, mm -hmm. self-advocacy, advocacy for one's families and your parents and others. They had to actually overcome the ideas of society, mm -hmm. think independently and say, no, I'm going to advocate for what I think is right. Even if society tells me that what I'm doing is, is harmful to my child, right. I am going to take a different tack. When you take a look at, at how this has been encapsulated in, in, um, in situations like the Olmstead, Olmstead case, mm -hmm. which, which you should describe, as well as the uh, American with Disabilities mm -hmm. Act, uh, let's start off with the Olmstead situation. Well, Olmstead came about actually nine years after the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. And Olmstead really started because of two women in Georgia who wanted to live in the community and not in an institution. And all along the line, everybody kept saying, no, you can't, no, you can't. They didn't need, did they need support in the community to be successful? Yes, they did. But they went all the way to the Supreme Court and they won. And so that was really the beginning of person-centered thinking and planning where it was about who is this person and what do they want in their lives and where do they want to live and where do they want to work? Let's start there instead of a number of professionals saying this is what's right for you, this is what's good for you, this is what we want for you. And so that was the beginning of that. Um, and it really was because of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which will be 30 years old this year, um, that, that, that that power, so to speak, was there for those people, that they felt that they had the right to advocate for themselves, which is really critical for people with disabilities, much more important than a professional doing that on their behalf. I mean, it all we work together, but individuals really advocating for themselves is very powerful. What was it like before the American with Disabilities Act? Well, what it was was people were at home or in institutions and not able to go out and work or be a part of their church. Couldn't or go to a library. Couldn't go to a library. Was, there you there might have been in. three steps. Right, right. 
You know, and it also accessibility goes even beyond people with that are using uh, uh, an assisted device like a wheelchair. You know, there's a lot of different barriers that come into play for individuals with disabilities who are trying to participate and belong in their community. That's what the whole thing is about. So now people are working, you know, not as many as could be, and so that's still a process. You know, and people are, um, transportation has gotten better, bus systems have gotten better, curb cuts are out there. Um, and so those type of things are really important and they really benefit broad spectrum people, not even just people with disabilities, if, you know, if you want to get into the detail. But that's the part that I think is just the beautiful part is that people really having their own life and living the life that they want to live. That's where we're at and we're still working towards that. I think about that in regards to employment. You know, we still have some work to do in that. And housing, right now we have a terrible housing crisis actually and Arc Northland works a lot with people in that, in that area trying to help people get into places, help get them started through grants through the Department of Human Services. All those types of things need to be helpful so people can kind of get launched and then self-sufficiency then is really the plan and if they're working and they have you know a meaningful job and then they feel like they're actually contributing to their own welfare and their own taking care of themselves. You started to unpack some of your programs but let's go further into the types of programs that you have. Mm -hmm. Could you describe a bit how you organized your budget and also the kind of programs that you provide to uh, people living with disability and their families and others. Absolutely. Um, all, all ARCs across the country pretty much have what they call a core services. And our number one, of course, is advocacy. And we do that in a number of ways. We assist individuals that might be a child who has a special education program and had an IEP uh, plan, an individual education plan, where we're assisting them there all the way up to somebody that might have a an, an, uh, housing or an employment situation where we need to try to help support and advocate. We do a lot of training. We do a lot of information and referral in that program. It's very broad and it's very person-centered on what the person is calling and asking. We don't even really ask a person what their disability is. We just ask what they're looking for. If they want to share that with us, that's fine because it doesn't matter to us. Um, we also have our housing program. We have a number of services in our housing program, three in particular, that assist people with getting um, set up with furniture, uh, maybe a security deposit, those types of things, helping them find apartments or a house or uh, get on, help them get to, uh, to Section 8, things of that nature. We also assist people that are under the age of 65 that want to get out of a nursing home or a, or a situation like that into a more community-based living situation. So that, that department is extraordinarily busy. I mean, we have uh, people calling and walking in all the time. Uh, another one of our programs is uh, called PCA Choice, where we're literally helping an individual who needs a personal care assistant, and they hire their own person. We don't do the hiring, we don't do any of that managing, but we do help with the onboarding, um, the payroll, things of that nature, so that type of burden, carry the liability, um, on that type of, per then that person doesn't have to deal with those type of things, they just focus on the care that they have. And then lastly, we have a regional quality council, and we've been, that's a part of a grant through the Department of Human Services, and we've been out for four years, well, we're in our fourth year now, um, literally meeting with people to ask them about their quality of life. You know, how do, how do you feel about where you live, where you work, you know, how is the transportation, what do you think about your case manager, what do you think about your um, provider of um, services and whatnot, you know, and so then we feed that information back to the Department of um, Human Services, and we're actually in a process right now where it's possible we might start being in a situation where we could start expediting change locally through that program. That's what um, our hope is in the next phase of that. And so basically we're, we're, we're pretty well rounded and but yet I, there could be things that are coming in where something that people are looking for that we don't know exactly how to solve that problem. So then we'll go out and we'll start networking and collaborating with other agencies um, or businesses or whatever the case may be to try to help take care of what's happening. Let's say I'm not disabled. Mm -hmm. Let's say I know nobody who is disabled. None of my family members have been mm -hmm. disabled. What is it in it for me? Well, after working 40 years in this profession, I can say it's the most incredibly teaching um, opportunities that I've had in my life. 
beyond my own brother, you know, as, as far as growing up in a home that has somebody with a disability. I have learned so much from the broad spectrum of people that I've met, um, whether they're very, very involved and can barely, art, you know, articulate what they're thinking or feeling, all the way to people who you wouldn't even be able to tell that they had a disability, because maybe they have a seizure disorder and you wouldn't know unless they were having a seizure. And so to me, it's the attitude of, who are who are the who's the person next to you just getting to know who they are even despite if they have a disability it's really about finding out who the person is and having that disability just it, it doesn't matter and i think that's part of us um have creating opportunities for people to be together whether you had so instead of a segregated situation where it's just people with disabilities you just invite people from all different walks of life to come together to meet one another. There's uh, movements happening right now in Duluth with that, they're calling them community conversations where there's a variety of providers, but also people that are just from the community, whether they have a disability, they may be a family member, they may just be an interested person. I'm trying to figure out how do we bring just people together? And um, this particular group is focusing in on making those connections for people with disabilities because it's a lot of times it's who you know and how you get to know them and things like that that help bring things into your life that help you grow. But I think it goes both ways. People with disabilities bring a, whole, a lot to everybody, to people's world. So doesn't it come down to what is the meaning of, uh, of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. what, what enriches our lives? When we go out and we experience a great work of art or a film, mm -hmm. something very mundane, mm -hmm. uh, a ball game that, it, that, that, that is taking place, when we go out and we experience the weather, we are experienced machines. Mm -hmm. We are entities that, that really enjoy uh, learning new things. And so when we interact with somebody with a different perspective, a different ability, a different right. disability, mm -hmm. a different way of being, that can be tremendously enriching if we get rid of our own fears, our own awkwardness. Right. Right. right, and we actually can share. We can share person to person with somebody and just listen to them. Right, that right. could be that could be just amazing. Exactly, it's the lack of experience that really makes us ignorant, to me. And you know, and I think the more that we give people the opportunity to just meet people, and you hit it right on the head when you said people's different abilities, because at the arc, that's what we focus on is somebody's abilities. We don't just you know we don't want to say well what can't you do or what you know what's your disability or it's it's not important. It's what can you do and what do you want to do? What do you want to learn and where do you want to go? Lori Berner, this has been a wonderful conversation of the work of the arc uh, Northland. Thank you so much for describing the challenges and the opportunities of people with disabilities enabled by the ARC, and thank you so much. Thank you, for your I insights. really appreciate your time. Appreciate it very much for the invitation.